I'm afraid I've got some bad news. I knew it. I- you know, we all love these, Brian. You can't wait to see the wrestling weddings. They're all just gold, Jerry, just gold. Can't wait to see the wrestling weddings. Normally, the wrestling weddings involve an actual star in the company. That's the best ones. But this, they're doing... a. Probably nothing has ever been consistently as bad as wrestling weddings. They always suck. They're always hokey and phony. Um, in this, usually they're done with stars. In this case, that wasn't even the case. They have, I can't call Pip Sabian and his lovely bride Penelope Pitstop underneath talent because do they ever even really wrestle? They just come out and do stupid shit with goofball Miro. Miro! I want them to team up Miro and Rio so we can sing their introductions. But can you call Pip Sabian underneath talent when he's never even wrestling? He's just there to do this stupid comedy with video games? I mean, he's definitely underneath. <laughs> well, you got he got me again there. You, you're coming in pretty pretty hot today. Pretty good today with these comebacks there. We should tape earlier more often. <laughs> The best part of this was Father James Mitchell, good old Daryl Van Horn presiding, because he don't give a fuck. And uh, he 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 kept it halfway clean. On Smoky Mountain TV one time, he started chanting and fucking conjuring Prince Karis up from the Egyptian tombs by speaking Kiz Arnie about Wizette Kizan Safiza Kamizi. With my Wizette Kizan Tut. Nobody ever figured it out. Anyway, um... So Mitchell was the best part about it. Jerry Lynn walked Penelope out. Jerry Lynn looks younger than the fucking wrestlers on the roster still. I don't know why Penelope was wearing white. She ought to be wearing fucking magenta with purple stripes. I understand that she's had more dicks in her than a urinal in Madison Square Garden. Hey, but I'm not one that's not. Nah, that's, no, stop old, it. that's just an old joke. I don't know anything about her personal life. She looked pretty good in that dress. You can't take that away from her. She's attractive. I wish she'd become a model so we could just look at pictures of her and not see her on a wrestling program. Uh, she's very attractive. Pip would be a wonderful model for children's clothing. If we just didn't have to watch him on wrestling. Miro! Miro would be a fucking wonderful model for what what could he model? Eastern European drug dealers. There you go. Either that or the fucking maintenance personnel's uniforms. He'd look good in one of those jumpsuits like Colt Cabana used to wear with his name on his fucking name tag like a guy that works at a gas station, which is probably where Miro's going to be uh, now that he has to depend on his wrestling talent has no help with anybody getting him over despite himself. Anyway, um... JR mentioned, well, there, James Mitchell presiding for the hopefully short ceremony, which the ceremony was short, and I thought we were going to get lucky, but then it it kept going from there. Uh, they did, Pip shared his vows, which was some alleged comedy that he'd memorized. Penelope did the same, but not as well. She was going for a dick jo- joke, but he cut her off. It was short, I wrote down, but still seemed long. Mitchell had to say the word kayfabe twice. That's the only part I didn't like about what Mitchell was doing. There's no reason you could you could have done all the good shit without using insider terminology. Uh, Miro shot down the objections question, so it, we didn't get to hear that. And I know because they had him in some kind of fucking marriage deal with that fucking goofy Lana, right? Uh on well, the WWE, and they're program. really married. Him and that goofy Lana, as you. Put oh, fuck! That's right. The one that she had first. She was Russian. Then she wasn't Russian. That she had an accent. She didn't have an accent. I've seen her a couple times. She was the fucking drizzling shits. And then she was <laughs> rushing into the arms of Bobby Lashley. Yeah, whatever the fuck. But so they did a bunch of comedy wedding shit with her and him, and so he's the one. But now they're referring to goofy stupid shit that was bad on the other fucking company's program and they've got to remind people that the same people that did bad goofy stupid shit on the other program are now doing the same thing on their program how is that productive in any way shape or form is it no you know the answer no of course not 
If it was any, the only people that thought that shit was any good when they did it were the people that were in it. And that's because they don't even know what's good in wrestling. Because who the fuck have they, th these people have never even seen wrestling and they're perpetrating it. And they're being told what to do by the people they work for who know less than they do. Oh my God. I, I, as this was going on, I wrote in capital letters, this is the TNT network. I could understand if it was some local fucking independent promotion on a local station or whatever, you know, you, you, you do what you, but this is supposed to be national cable and legitimate professional people here. Of course, Chuck, the buttle fuck is there. He's the Butler. They won him. He brought the champagne Miro rattled off some nonsense in his accent, and I never can understand what he's saying. And then he pointed at a box. There was a gift wrapped box in there, so he went over and beat it up, and it was an empty box. And well, you always say whatever's in the box, whoever's whoever in the box, whoever comes out of a box gets over. Gets over. What happens if there's no one in the box? <laughs> Nothing gets over. And here's proof. It was an empty box for an empty segment. It was so bad that when fucking Miro was trying to do the toast thing the 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 actual fans not the ones at ringside but the actual fans they've let in in the upper deck started singing to uh, entertain themselves he said what is love and they started what is love baby don't hurt me then they're singing and so he had to go with it because they were so bored and this was so bad that even the people who like everything including the taste of their own shit and support AEW was do, going into business for themselves. Somehow, Miro finishes his statement and tries to go over and do something and has been chained to the rope, has been leg shackled to the rope without him knowing it. Chuck the Buttlefuck apparently did it off camera. And so now with him leg ironed to the bottom rope, Chuck was able to nail Pip who bumped into Penelope, who took a stagey fall into the fucking cake. And then they beat up Chuck, but Pockets came out of the cake and beat Pip up. Brian, has anything this stupid, this bad, this poorly done, this unprofessional involving people who are so unknown in this business on an overall basis ever been done on Raw? Ever? Oh, I don't want to just say no without researching that because there's a chance but you gotta think but this is certainly an homage to the awfulness of monday night raw people constantly have criticized this was supposed to be the sports-based presentation for the dog and pony show that they've turned pro wrestling into but yet not only is this was this as poorly done as poorly executed as silly and stupid and fake as anything been done on Raw, but they it wasn't even done by stars. It wasn't even done by people who looked like stars. It wasn't even done by people who you could say, well, say what you want about what they're doing now, but gosh, they were great when so-and-so because... Welcome to The Hoops Podcast. This is a podcast about life, which just happens to be centered and focused around the world of professional wrestling. We tackle the topics of the week, both inside and outside of the squared circle, while also focusing on the issues that are plaguing the world today. Whether it's wrestling, sports, life, or anything in general, we've got you covered right here on The Hoots Podcast. And now, here's your host... Josh Lopez. And, and if that doesn't work, then by God. Me and my friend Mark, we're going to stop watching. That's right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 244 of the Hoops Podcast. It's Thursday, 
February 11, 2021. It's yours truly, the nefarious brother Adam. Uh, you can call me Josh if you like. You can follow me at Twitter at the Hoots Podcast. I'm also on Instagram at Joshie Lopez94. That's J O S H I E Lopez94 on Instagram and also at Josh Lopez Music. Um, recording this live in the Good Brothers Studio in Chicago, Illinois. This is a live slash pro wrestling podcast. Hopefully, to make this a positive experience for you guys, like a positive mental escape for all the negative Nelly wrestling podcasts that are out there, kind of break up the minutia. And uh, we're here to have fun. Um, I'm also here to give out advice and uh, talk about some real topics. And that's what we're going to do here. That's what we do here at the Boots Podcast. we got a lot of wrestling to break down. I just covered the uh, night two event of the new beginning in Hiroshima uh, just about a half an hour ago. <laughs> so you'll get my thoughts on that later on in the podcast. Also, we got... Two pay per views to uh, make predictions for. Yes, this weekend we got NXT Takeover Vengeance Day, which will be taking place on Sunday. While you guys are uh, in Valentine's Day lore and uh, trying to figure out if you're stuck in a uh, flaky situation, yours truly will be covering uh, NXT Takeover Vengeance Day. It should be a good night. And then um, also. Uh, we got Impact Wrestling. They got a pay view coming up on Saturday called No Surrender. Uh, a throwback for their TNA days. Uh, glad that they brought that back event. They brought that event back. And um, No Surrender will be taking place uh, in Nashville on Impact Plus. It's a specialty event. So, a lot of wrestling to talk about. And of course, we're on the road to the Elimination Chamber a week from this Sunday as well for the WWE. Run the road to WrestleMania. Lots of roads. <laughs> uh, and, of course, uh, AEW. Uh, we get into our uh, popular segment, What the Hell is Wrong with AEW later on. And, of course, and finally the last thing, uh, the thoughts of Derrico with the one and only Brett Carter. Make sure you listen to that towards the end of the podcast. Uh, I wanted to mention really quick, uh, you could subscribe to the podcast right now. It comes to you free of charge every single Thursday. We don't charge you a single cent to watch or listen to this podcast, and we do appreciate the support. Make sure you can subscribe to our YouTube channel since we're simulcasting this segment, and um, you get all the episodes of the Hoops Podcast and all my old radio interviews I used to do on ChicagolandSportsRadio.com, and <laughs> it's crazy, man. Uh, in March, we'll be celebrating eight years as a broadcaster. And it's been a fun ride, and it's been a fun journey, and a fun experience. So, um, yeah, let's, let's have some fun, guys. Like, hit me up here in the chat box. Hit me up uh, with any questions you guys want to ask me, and we'll get going here. Uh, I do want to mention one other thing, uh, two things, actually. Uh, please, if you could, um, leave us a four- or five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts from. Leave us a review. I want to know what you guys think about the show, possibly or negatively. It helps expand and reach the show and get a better gauge on what you guys feel about the podcast. And then, uh, finally, bookmark ProWrestlingTranscriptions.com. All right, pal. Enough of the plugs. Let's get into business here. Uh, we're going to start things off with the Good Brothers Q&A session. What it is, is my time to interact with you guys. You guys send me questions at the Hoots Podcast or the Hoots Podcast at gmail.com. And uh, I answer your questions. And it could be on a bevy of different topics. It doesn't have to be just pro wrestling. And um, I'm excited to uh, answer your questions and um, get going on with the rest of the podcast. So let's, let's have some fun, shall we? All right. We're going to start off with a ladies' question. A uh, good friend of mine. Her name's Nicole. You can follow her at, tw- at Twitter at the Truth ND. Shout out to Nicole. She asks, "Curious, what you thought about the whole Jay White situation? Do you think he was on his way out before people started talking shit?" I don't think that he was on his way out, Nicole. And I think that's the interesting lore about the Switchblade. Where, yeah, as a character, he complains a lot. And he does <laughs> resemble a lot of Shia LaBeouf characteristics in a lot of ways. But I think that's also intriguing about Jay White. And he's a very good manipulator in playing mind games. And he keeps you on the edge of your, uh, edge of your seats. And 
Jim White did a good job of uh, playing everybody. And would I have been shocked if he showed up at the Royal Rumble? No. Do I think JY would be in New Japan long term? I think that just that's for him to decide. I think with his situation is very fluid and what he what does he want? If he's he's already been an IWGP heavyweight champion. So he, there's nothing that he hasn't accomplished in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Yeah, maybe he hasn't uh won a Wrestle Kingdom main event yet, but I think when you look at uh Jay White He's done what he's needed to do in uh, New Japan, in my opinion. And if you wanted to take that chance to go to a different promotion or something like that, I think that would work out for him. So I, I, I'm a big fan of Jay White. As you guys can tell, I'm a big New Japan Pro Wrestling fan. So I really enjoy Jay White, and I'm excited for his future. And um, people are always going to talk shit about performance that they don't know from other companies. I, you know, I remember somebody last year telling me, oh, um, you should be cautious. You know, no wrestling company pays your bills. Well, actually, the entire wrestling business pays my bills, actually. <laughs> Not to steal a uh, line from Finn Balor, you know, uh, he says he doesn't watch this business. This business watches me. Well, this business pays me. I don't pay wrestling companies to cover their work, <laughs> cover their programming, you know. I... Uh, that's part of being a student of the game, I guess. But <laughs> I, I love Jay White, and he has a bright future ahead of him. So I'm not surprised people talk shit. People talk shit by the, the moment they open their eyes the next day. People are just triggered every time they breathe these days. It's weird. All right. Uh, next batch of questions will be coming from my good buddy, Ed at King Edward 15. He says, what can we do to get rid of the Meltzers and Alvarez's of the wrestling journalism bu bubble and get fresh guys in? Well, I think you just hit the nail on the head right there. It's a bubble, and the voices of wrestling are just outdated. They bring nothing new to the table when it comes to their perspective on pro wrestling. And I feel really sad for the future generations of wrestling fans because we're growing up in the era of entitlement, uh, being morose on air, uh, just being condescending, and uh, just... Basically leading wrestling fans astray and being run amok. Honestly, we're all being hoodwinked. We're being hoodwinked by the marquee guys in the wrestling media. Now, here's the thing with me. I stay in my lane. I'm not a reporter. I'm not an analyst. I'm not an expert. I make wrestling transcripts. And I'm a professional broadcaster. That's what I am. That's what I do. You know, these two guys pretend that there's something that they're not. I saw the tweet that Dave Meltzer put out a couple weeks ago where he's like, oh, you look at the last bookers of the year for the wrestling server, they all took notes from me. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, honestly, I'm sorry for the language out of the way, but like, seriously, go fuck yourself, Dave Meltzer. And same thing goes to you, Brian Alvarez, a guy who limit uh, tries to limit and decrease the seriousness of leukemia. Seriously? Come on. Who are you fooling? I can't stand these two dweebs. And they make what I do for a living as a joke. They do. Because their reporting is falsely based. They don't give out what their sources are. <laughs> Calling Dave Meltzer an insider or an analyst is a spit in the face of people like Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, Tim Kirshen, uh, at, um... Adam Wojnarowski from the NBA, people who are actual journalists and do real reporting, not this BS speculation nonsense, you're spinning in their face. So I, I have no respect for those guys. Oh, what's up, Sarah? How you doing, girl? Nice to see you here in the chat box. Uh, yeah, I. the thing is, as a fan base, we need to figure out what we want in our coverage. Because I feel like my field of wrestling media does a disservice for future wrestling fans. You go to any website, you listen to any wrestling podcast, and it'll make you feel bad about being a wrestling fan because people are so stuck in their bubble about, oh, this is how Booker should be this way, Booker should be that way. Guys, we're watching a wrestling television show. You're not in the wrestling business. You're not responsible for whether these shows are good or not. And you know what? I... Can't stand 
just the culture of wrestling media today. Something has to change. These two guys always go soapboxes about the WWE relying on older talent, but the voices of wrestling in 2021 are 45 years old and 61. Think about that. It's just embarrassing. It really is. <laughs> you going grocery shopping? That's nice. <laughs> I went grocery shopping last week. Uh, they really uh, grocery shopping is the first stage of knowing that you're being an adult and just understanding that uh, you gotta balance your money and shit. Because groceries ain't cheap, pal. Um, <laughs> um, do ratings really matter? Does it change how you view a show? Do I think ratings matter? I think they matter to the networks that uh, employ these wrestling promotions. But for me, as a wrestling fan, no, I don't care about ratings. I care about the product that you put on TV, and that's the difference on how I view a show as opposed to the common person that hosts a wrestling podcast or runs a website. For me, I really don't care who's getting pushed or being buried. I really don't care about the behind-the-scenes stuff because when I break, out, break down these shows and I make the transcripts, I can really debunk any common narratives that you see on wrestling Twitter when it comes to whining about booking, who's being 50-50 booked, who's not. Like, I could really sit through that shit because, honestly, for me, you got to – here's the important thing about life, and I want I want you guys to understand this. Um, when it comes to life, no matter what you're doing, whether you're a broadcast, whether you're a musician, no matter what you do, you need to think before you speak. You need to apply context before you go on a soapbox about something. I will stress that to the cows go home, to – Young people that want to be a broadcaster or a podcaster or people who want to work in the media in general, you have to apply context to what you have to say. I speak for myself. You should never allow somebody to speak for you or tell you how you should view a wrestling show. I think that's ridiculous. We could all have our uh, agreements and disagreements on whether wrestling should be TV 14 or PG. For me, I watch it because I love this stuff since I was four years old, and I try to learn something new with everything, with every show that goes on air each week. You know, I cover 14 wrestling shows a week. If anybody can tell the difference in presentations of wrestling promotions, it's me. I've seen Lucha, i see seen Strong Style, i see American Style Wrestling, i see Spots Fest, i see seen Mud Shows. I see any style of wrestling known to man. And for me to still enjoy it, even though this is my career and what I do for a living now, I watch, I view it in trying to see if they do something different. Like, I don't need an answer to a storyline on one episode of Raw or Dynamite or SmackDown or New Japan. I try to watch these shows for what they are and make sure that the transcripts... Uh, read well to you guys as well. So for me, like, do ratings matter? No, they don't matter in the wrestling bubble, the wrestling echo chamber, because people are doing it in false ways. <laughs> you you guys base your thoughts on ratings on stuff you read from Wrestling Inc. Like, think about that. You guys are going off of ratings based out of rounding errors. I tell anybody who really thinks they're an expert on television and how the media landscape works, go to a media school and actually do some research. Like, <laughs> you'll find out that Nielsen is an outdated metric system in media and entertainment these days. But you guys want to rely on that so much on Wrestling Inc. It's, it's, it's nonsense. Browning, what's up, buddy? How are you doing, my man? Thanks for checking out the video. Uh, if you have any questions for me, just hit me up in the chat box, right, bud? Uh, next question. Who will be the starting QB for the Bears this season? I have no idea. Your, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's a lot of options. Uh, I want the best for the Bears. Um, I don't think Mitch Trubisky as, is the worst quarterback in the NFL as people make him out to be. Um, that's just my opinion on the situation, but for me, I like I liked the roster of the Bears. I don't like their head coach. Uh, it doesn't matter who you bring in as the starting quarterback when Matt Nagy is so stubborn in his ways and, 
and tie down and buy down in analytics, you're not going to go anywhere. So what, what's, what's the point? <laughs> oh, we're going to trade four draft picks for Deshaun Watson. We're going to trade three draft picks and a player for Carson Wentz. It's not going to make a difference. <laughs> Oh, man, that's a good line right there, Browning. And then. <laughs> that's the Bears' QB situation. And then. Okay, we go from Kyle Orton to Jay Cutler, Rex Grossman, uh, Chad Henney. No, no, uh, Caleb Haney, uh, <laughs> Jason Campbell, Mike Glennon, Mitch Trubisky, Mark Sanchez, Tyler Bray, Chase Daniels, Nick Foles. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then. I feel like the Bears movie is set in the movie, Do Where's My Car? Because it's going nowhere. I haven't seen a good quarterback in my whole life. I'm, I'm going to be 27 in May, and I haven't seen a good quarterback yet. <laughs> um, all right. Next. Next question. We're going to scroll up in the inbox portion here on Twitter, and we're going to hit up the good brother, Chris Saletta. At X Team Zaletta Twenty Four X on Twitter. Thanks for saying questions. Always good, brother. Who's impressed you so far this NBA season? I'll be honest with you guys. I've been out of the loop with the NBA because I've been so busy with moving and um, handling the transcript schedule. I just haven't been able to really watch the NBA. I see. I see some things from. From afar, like I saw the stuff about Mark Cuban and the national anthem. I'm not going to get into that. But as far as like from my what from what I have seen from the Bulls, I have been impressed by um, Patrick Williams. I'm, I'm I'm not surprised by Zach Levine. I'm really happy for him because a lot of people in the Chicago sports radio market talk shit about him and try to decrease his value as a player. But Zach Levine's a really good uh, basketball player, so I really enjoy his work. So um, Bulls, um, hopefully they can find a way to sneak in the playoffs this year. Um, looks like Seth Curry's getting back into form. Uh, the Lakers are still the Lakers. Um, I'm trying my best to see what I could pop off the top of my head, but I, I'll be honest, I have not been watching it as much as I should. Maybe I could, maybe in the weekends now that the football season's over, but um, I've just been really busy. Will you be tuning into Bloodsport Saturday? No, I will not. Uh, nothing against Josh Barnett. It's just not my style of stuff I want to watch, to be honest with you. Uh, Browning asks, am I going to watch uh, Vengeance on Sunday? Yes, yes, uh, Browning. I'll be uh, covering that event uh, on Sunday. This should be a fun show to uh, check out. Have you checked out Kurt Angle's podcast? No, not yet, but I want to. I really been trying to scale down on the wrestling podcast that I have been listening to, uh, Chris, and I do want to check out Kurt Angle's podcast. He has an interesting perspective, and I'm just curious to see how Kurt Angle would be on air in a podcast. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm sure you can tell good stories. You know, I I admire Conrad Thompson's uh, hustle and what he does to hustle out money and what he does with the, all these uh, different shows. And he has at freeshows.com. Uh, Conrad Thompson, former guest of the PWE show, by the way, uh, very talented guy, a very good entrepreneur. So shout out to Conrad. The guy's a beast. Um, how do you feel about your Bulls backcourt of Levine and Kobe White? I like them. Um, obviously, the thing with the Bulls right now is they had to learn how to win. And they've been so bobbed down by Jim Boylan and Fred Hoiberg over the last four or five seasons. So what you're seeing is they have a lot of competitive games, but the Bulls, and some, sometimes they find a way to finish games, and sometimes they lose it in the last minute. And uh, I like the roster, how it's formulating, but for me, um, I... Um, I, I like what I've seen from Kobe White. I saw yesterday that they tied the NBA record for most threes in a game as a tandem, uh, tying Clay, uh, Clay Thompson and Steph Curry. So I like what I've seen so far from the Bulls' backcourt. Uh, back By the way, folks, stop putting Zach Levine in trade rumors. There's no reason why that dude should be traded. Come on. Better Undertaker theme, uh, American Badass or Roland? Oh, man, that's a good question. I know you're going to hit me with this one because I'm an Undertaker guy. 
Um, I think for me, I'll probably say, um, I gotta go with, um, I gotta go with Roland. I think that's my favorite, uh, American Badass theme song for The Untaker is Roland. That's, that's the one that stands out the most to me. Um, should Keith Lee be the one to take the U.S. title off of Lashley? No, I think, uh, Damian Priest should be the one to take the U.S. title off of Lashley. Do you think we'll get Priest and Brock at some point? I don't think so, but, um... I'm very excited for the future for Damian Priest. I think he's going to do a lot of good stuff in WWE. And his talent will supersede anything that's thrown in his way. You know, he's doing this thing right now with Bad Bunny. And you're introducing Damian Priest to a new audience and casual viewers. And the guy has all the charisma in the world to lead him to any path he wants. Do I think it's something where I see Damian Priest versus Brock Lesnar at a SummerSlam or Mania soon? No, I do not. Um... With Ty Valkyrie's contract with Impact uh, coming up, uh, is she NXT slash WWE bound? Uh, Taya is a very underrated female wrestler, in my opinion. Uh, I'm I'm a big fan of hers. Uh, she has she has a great waterfall, but she's a really good wrestler. I first was introduced to Taya in Lucha Underground, and she's very good at what she does. So I I would love to see her in WWE if that's the case, but I wouldn't be surprised if she went to AEW because they could use some more women in their division. So, <laughs> um, what do you think of Cody's forming of the Nightmare Family team? Uh, indifferent, <laughs> kind of like everything uh, that pumps out of Jacksonville. I'm just indifferent to. Um, Look, I, I'll give credit where credit's due. I, out of the, like, four key, like, elite guys, I think Cody Rhodes is my favorite out of the four. I can't stand Olivier, and the and the Buck Hogan and Balding Buck is the most overrated tag team I've seen in my life. But Cody does have good matches. But there's also times where he has this, like, Triple H complex where he has to make everything about himself, and I'll mention that later on in the podcast. But for me... Uh, yeah, you can have a faction with your brother and QC Marshall, but is it really going to mean anything? There's like nine factions in AEW, so what's this? how's this one going to stand out? Um, do you think Cody will ever get his title shot back? Uh, I mean, when you're the Jeff Jarrett of the modern era, I guess you could uh, find a way to pen, uh, pencil yourself in, pal. Um, you always know about the most dangerous weapon in wrestling is the, uh, either the eraser or the pen too. Um, you never know. <laughs> uh, which current tag team would you like to see Edge and Christian face if they were to come together? One tag team and one tag team only, the Grizzled Young Veterans. You're welcome for that. <laughs> I love the Grizzled Young Veterans. Uh, shout out to, uh, Chris, uh, for those questions, by the way. I really do appreciate those really good questions, brother. Uh, next batch of questions we're going to get to is from the good brother Sam Piopo at Second City Sam. Um, he f- asked the question here, who do I prefer, Dean Ambrose or John Moxley? I'm going to switch my answer to this, uh, Sam. I'm going with New Japan John Moxley because I'm not a fan of John Moxley in AEW. So uh, give me New Japan John Moxley over Dean Ambrose and AEW John Moxley. I think that, that, that'll, that'll work. Uh, favorite Kurt Angle match? Uh, that, that's an easy one. Uh, definitely be the one with Shawn Michaels from WrestleMania 21. Uh, it's one of the best, uh, technical wrestling matches I've ever seen in my life. Uh, you know, the great thing about WrestleMania over the years, I always scoff at Meltzer where he's like, oh, they call it WrestleMania, but they never have five-star wrestling matches. Yeah, because your eyes are just so ma- majestic when it comes to what's good in pro wrestling, right? Um, Kurt Angle um, against Shawn Michaels is one of the best like non-marquee singles matches in WrestleMania history, and it's not even close. Do you think Corbin's King gimmick has run its course? Um, it does if we're not going to have another King of the Ring tournament. I'll say that. Uh, I do like his work. I do like what he does as a heel. I think he's underappreciated and undervalued by today's wrestling fans because 
uh, today's wrestling fans are today's wrestling fans. But uh, King Corbin is very good, in my opinion. The gimmick will probably run out, run its course if we're not going to have another King of the Ring tournament. So that's something we need to look out for in the summer. Uh, with AEW's ratings at their peak, how long until the company is dead? Well, that's a good question because <laughs> uh, sooner or later, the shit's going to hit the fan. Look, you have friends that are EVPs and working in the boardroom and are part of the creative team. It, something is going to happen. Something is going to happen. Honestly, like, when you get into business with some people, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I, I'm just being very cautious because I know a lot, I know there's a lot of hang, hang landing in, um, uh, AEW, but at the same time, um, <laughs> you got a mark, you got a mark booker as the promoter who's, Basically letting Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez format his show, let's just be honest. And then you got EVP guys, they're all egomaniacs. Something is going to happen sooner or later. So I'm not going to count and say, oh, I'm going to guarantee that AEW is going to die in a couple years. That probably won't be the case, but something will happen sooner or later, trust me. Um, okay, which one of the three would you pick? Carson Wentz, Marcus Mariota, or Derek Carr? Um, man. Shout out to uh, good brother Adam Daly as well. I'm going to go with uh, Derek Carr. Uh, th- that would be my pick. Um, you know, it's really not a lot of fun to choose from, but <laughs> this is the predicament we're in. Uh, I'm going to go with Derek Carr in that one. Um, I don't want to buy into the fact that Carson Wentz is completely useless and can't do anything anymore, but... I, I value uh, mental health, and I value pe- uh, players' mental health especially. And in this market, it's just a, a accident way to happen if Carson Wentz comes here. Um, I'm just going to say that. Um, thanks for checking it out, Brian. I appreciate you, buddy. I hope you have a good day. Um, yeah, I'll go with Derek Carr because um, – he has really nothing to lose, in in my opinion, when it comes to this. So, I for me, I would say that um, that Derek Carr would uh, be the one that the Bears eventually get. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see the reaction if they do end up trading for once. But I think um, um, Derek Carr will be the guy. Um, let's take a quick swig of water, real quick. Ah, here we go. Favorite Cubs and Sox player of all time? Well, let's see. My favorite Cub player of all time is tied. Uh, it's uh, John Lester and Sammy Sosa. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to get some heat for that, but I don't care. Uh, uh, Sammy Sosa was at his peak when I was like a really young kid at the time when I first started watching baseball. Uh, and uh, John Lester, uh, I think he's a guy that really, like, brought the Cubs to the next level of credibility and what that organization was. So John Lester and Sammy Sosa were probably my favorite uh, Cub players of all time. Uh, my favorite Sox player of all time is uh, Frank Thomas. And um, I think uh, Paul Canerco is not that far behind him as well. So... Uh, Frank Thomas, definitely the big hurt, is uh, my favorite Sox player of all time. And my favorite baseball player of all time, outside of uh, Alex Rodriguez. So, uh, good question, Sam. I appreciate you, brother. Uh, all right. Another question we got here on the list was um, from a good brother, Jason Howe, at Jedi Fett on Twitter. Go uh, support that good brother on Twitter as well. He asks, what theme song would I pick? If I were to walk into the room, like any room, like what song would I pick to, I don't know, make Basket My Glory or something like that? <laughs> uh, I guess that's where he's going with the question. But I think for me, uh, I would say, um, there's a lot of, to choose from. I mean, I could go old school Undertaker if I wanted to. Um, I'll give you two. I'll go with either uh, Killer Cross's theme song or um, 
It's Fire Burns, uh, CM Punk's original uh, WWE theme song. So those are the two I pick. Uh, Killer Cross or um, CM Punk. That's a good question, though. Like, what 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 song would you walk into a building with? Like, what would be your entrance theme? I'm always curious about that for you. Like, what would be your wrestling entrance theme? Um, let's go back to the mailbox on Twitter real quick. We're going to take in some questions from the good brother Tony S., referee Tony S., uh, one of my favorite referees in the business. Uh, wrestling promotions, I don't know why you're not signed this dude. You guys are... Uh, making your referee crews look bad when you not do that. Um, sh- check out Tony's podcast, by the way, the TBD Wrestling Podcast with my other good brother, Mitchell Mick McNeil. Uh, they have a great podcast. Go check out their work. Uh, he asks, if there was any element for New Japan that you could bring to American professional wrestling, what would it be and why? Uh, Kevin Kelly. Um, <laughs> uh, the English commentary in New Japan Pro Wrestling is top notch. It makes my job easier as a transcriber. I really enjoy Kevin's work. He does an amazing job. And I think Kevin Kelly is just really good at his job. So uh, that would be the first thing. As far as like concepts and stuff like that, I would like to see the WWE try to do like a G1 style tournament. I think it would be a good um, added content for the network. Something like that, where you have a search of just decades to like G1 style match, whatever you want to call it in the WWE system, um, like round robin tournaments. Um, I think it would be really cool if they did like a G1 style tournament um, in WWE. So that would probably be the main thing I would take uh, for New Japan for wrestling. And it's okay to allow wrestlers to do like more forearm exchanges. Um, I'll say that. Okay. What was the first match that you vividly remember seeing when you first became a fan? Well, well, I think the first one that I do remember was um, the Undertaker Mankind Hell in the Cell match. You guys got to understand. I started watching wrestling in 1998, so I think that's the first one I remember in the in my head watching as a kid. I remember my dad telling me that I watched uh, WrestleMania 14 uh, with him uh, when I was younger. He was a actually my dad introduced me to professional wrestling. I never brought that up before. Uh, you got to thank my old man for uh, <laughs> introducing me to this wacky world of wrestling. So um, yeah, I, I think like the Mankind Undertaker one is ones that stand out. I remember Undertaker. Um, against Kane with Austin as a guest referee, and then Austin got fired, uh, something like that, uh, by Vince. It was in Chicago. I do remember that. So that late, like mid-1998 part of the year for WWE as they were getting into the Attitude Era. So those that would be my answer for that question. Uh, shout out to you, good boy. Thanks for those questions, man. All right. The last batch of questions we're going to get into today uh, comes from a man that has many talents. A man that's a good brother of all good brothers. Uh, a man that supported the Pipe Bomb with the Cool Company. The guy that supported the TV Wrestling Podcast. And a good brother of the Hoots Podcast. Who am I talking about? We're talking about Psycho Nagiri. Nate the Great. Heating us up here from Minnesota. Uh, you like that? You like that? <laughs> uh, would you be into it if a AEW superstar were to win an Impact Championship or vice versa? No. Hell no. Absolutely not. No shot. I'm not, I'm not knocking your question, Nate, but just the concept that AEW and Impact are working to, together is doing them both a disservice. Like, you have to be that desperate to leech on to New Japan and Impact and Garden more buzz because you can't build an identity for your own show. Think about that. Next question. Who's someone you'd like to see go to Impact in the future? Well, I gotta look at the landscape and see, like, who's out there and who could possibly release down the road. Um, 
I mean, if things don't work out with there to be an Alistair Black, I think Alistair Black would do good in Impact. Uh, you know, he could uh, join Selena down there as well. So, uh, I like to see Leo Rush in Impact. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, I like to see Brian Cage and LAX go back to Impact because that's where they're the best. <laughs> so, those are the ones that come off the top of my head. I don't see Moxley going there. I don't see Jericho going there. Not, maybe Jericho will go there. Um, but those are the ones that stand out to me. Um, will Leo Rush be the flag bearer of the junior division for years to come, or do you think he still has a ways to go? I don't think he'll be the flag bearer, but I will say that Leo Rush could be like one of the top four guys in the junior division when it comes to New Japan, especially if he does more events there. And I, I'm pretty sure he will. Uh, once this pandemic is over and things start to uh, get back to normal, uh, I don't think he'll be the flag bearer. Uh, it's still the Hiromu Takahashi show until he stops wrestling. So, <laughs> uh, but he, Leo Rush could make a good case for it, though. He's very talented, and shout out to him. He won the uh, Triple A uh, Cruiserweight Championship last night on MLW Fusion. How do you think the NWA can reach a bigger audience? Well. Uh, I thought they were doing a good job at NW Power, but honestly, uh, they've been probably the biggest wrestling promotion that's been uh, affected by this pandemic. Uh, we had like a little short series of shockwave shows that I was covering about a couple months ago, and then they went on a hiatus again. So it's very unfortunate. And a lot of the top stars from NWA have left on to AEW and. Um, it's a bummer. I'm still a big fan of Nick Aldis, the real world champion. And I do mean that, the real world champion, uh, holding the 10 pounds of gold, or as he likes to call it, Sweet Charlotte. And I like Joe Galley. I like the whole crew. I love NW Power. Eric Stevens cracks me up. Um, I, I like the commentary with uh, Joe Galley and uh, Wade Barrett before he went to NXT. And um, uh, shout out to Dave Marquez as well. I I miss the NWA. I was just talking about this with my uncle the other day at the shop. Like, the, the great thing about the NWA is that they were doing their own thing. That's an alternative. Not this bullshit that we see on TNT every week. Next question. Oh, we got a good one here. Five least favorite foods. Oh, man. For me, uh, <laughs> as some people will watch this video, they won't be surprised with some of my answers, but I'd probably say number one on that list is tacos. I'm going to get a lot of heat for saying this, but tacos takes like pure dog shit, just like regular plain tacos. I, I can't do it. No, no shot. Uh, meatloaf on the list, yep, that, that hits number two. You know, you'd think I'd pick, like, a bunch of, like, greens and stuff or whatever. But, no, I, I'm just very picky with the vegetables that I do eat. But um, <laughs> uh, number three would be, uh, what the fuck is that called? Uh, Brussels sprouts. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of Brussels sprouts either. That, that tastes like fresh doo-doo butter. Um, scallops. Four, no, I, I I don't like scalps. And five, one of Matt Hardy's favorites, green beans. <laughs> no, no green beans. So we got five on the list. We got tacos, meatloaf, uh, I mentioned Brussels sprouts, scallops, and green beans. Those are the least five favorite foods for yours truly. You throw that at my face, I, I won't throw it in the garbage, but I will not eat it. <laughs> Um, what is the first title Damian Priest wins on the main roster? Um, I'd say the United States Championship. I think that's probably, uh, par for the course for him. I think that Damian Priest will find a way to, um, win on the main roster. Uh, the United States title, especially he's on the Raw brand. So, this is the thing. We have Damian Priest. You don't need to rush him into a WWE title pitcher. Let's, let's go with this slowly and let's enjoy the ride of Damian Priest. Um, will Walter ever get the throne and come to NXT? NXT. No, I don't think Walter is going to get the throne because he's the ring general. 
Walter's that dude, man. Like, Walter is so good at what he does in the ring as a performer. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Walter. And he is so good on NXT UK. Like, he's one of the best champions in all professional wrestling, in my opinion. I've mentioned before that if, I, if you guys want to know my preferences in wrestling... Uh, NXT UK is my favorite wrestling show outside the t-shirt that I'm wearing right now, actually. So, you would think Joshi is the old, everything on Raw and SmackDown is good guy. No, that's not the case. I don't think Raw and SmackDown is great, nor do I think it's horrible as a lot of you guys make it out to be. So, <laughs> uh, for me, uh, I look at Walter, and he's just so freaking good, man. I do think he will show up in NXT soon, because I keep seeing these uh, little ads that they've been popping up on NXT recently. Uh, I love Imperium. I love Walter. They're, they're fucking awesome. Uh, next question. Who would you have face Roman Reigns at Mania if it's not Edge? Well, it's definitely not Daniel Bryan. <laughs> um, that's the thing. I want to get you guys thoughts on this. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm not looking at it the right way. But if you're the tribal chief, right, and you've been so dominant to the point that nobody can stop you, where you have Kevin Owens going at you, can't do anything about it. Jay Uso goes at you, can't do anything about it. When you look, when you look at Roman Reigns. Obviously, John Cena is not going to be there this year. You just mentioned today he's not going to be at WrestleMania. You look at Roman Reigns. If you're the trial chief, wouldn't you want multiple people to go after you? Like, I had this idea about a possible fatal four-way match for the Universal title. Because I think Edge is going to fight Drew McIntyre. I do think that's that's going to happen. But I think when you look at Roman Reigns... I don't just see one guy on the SmackDown brand that should be like, okay, this is it for the SmackDown guy, and it's whatever. Like, Roman Reigns and Nakamura is not closing out WrestleMania. It'll be a great match. Don't get me wrong. It'll be an awesome match. But I don't see it happening that way. So, you know, like, Brock Lesnar's not going to pop up last minute, right? Like, who is Roman Reigns going to fight at WrestleMania? That's a very interesting question. If it was up to me, I'd do like some kind of cool like four, Fatal 4-Way four Elimination match, something like that. I have no interest in seeing Roman Reigns versus Daniel Bryan as a singles match. I don't. That's just me. I don't. Um, let's take a quick swing of water real quick. What is the most traumatic experience you've life so far, and how has it changed you in any way? Um, I have three uh, traumatic experiences that really like affect me the most. Uh, first one's my parents' divorce uh, when I was a senior in high school. Uh, how it changed me is it's brought me to where I am today, where I needed to um, not selfishly look out for myself, but I had to start like, growing up and become independent, like, really quick and really fast at a young age. And, um, you know, that stuff happens in life. I'm not the only person that's dealt with their parents getting divorced. You know, it is what it is. Um, but how does that affect me? Uh, I think it's affecting me for the better because it opened my eyes that, you know, this happens in life. And, you know, when life throws you obstacles, you have to be ready and be ready to be adaptable and keep your head up and push it forward to no matter what bad wave of energy that comes your way. That's how I go about my life. And I, I'm grim for that experience. You know, there's a sharp pain. It sucked. Uh, just like anybody else that deals with divorce, I still think about it to this day. But for me, like, it, it's made me a better person. So uh, it, has, it hasn't uh, affected me too bad as it did uh, in the beginning. Um, the second one um, was the loss of my nani. Um her name was Teresa Catalano. Um, my nani uh, lived uh, on the top level of my original home. And she was one of my <laughs> favorite people that I met in my entire life. I, I love her. I still think about her every day. I have a picture of an article about her after her passing that I have it on my fridge as a daily reminder for her being there with me. Um, she passed away. 
um, about 16 years ago. And um, I think about her a lot. Uh, my nanny was a um, very integral person in my life when it comes to um, how I am as a person. You know, a lot of people tell me that like, I'm sweet and genuine and honest and stuff like that. I, I get a lot of that from her. And um, what really sucks is that for me, not not for validation purposes, but I really wish um, she got to see like my development of being a uh, musician. She ran uh, the church um, group in my in my family's church, Holy Rosary here in Chicago, and um, she was the choir director. She played piano, and um, you know I have a lot of other uh, family members. Uh, from her kids that are uh, musicians. My grandpa, obviously, is a guitar player. Uh, my Aunt Berta now runs the choir at uh, Holy Rosary. Um, my Uncle Mark plays drums. Um, I have other family members that play music and stuff. Uh, I love my nanny very much. I miss her a lot every day. I think about her a lot, and I'm very grateful for her because she taught me a lot of good lessons about uh, being disciplined and being focused and being a good human being and uh, going by your word and um, trusting yourself. I think it's probably the biggest thing about that. And that's the thing about life. You never know when uh, losses are going to come your way and how you adapt to those situations. Some stink more than others, you know. And for me, I just never dealt with uh, dealt, never dealt with death well. I, I don't know who does, but for me, it's really bad. Like, I get, like, really numb in just going to, like, a wake or something like this. just something that's, like, sharp and something for me that I just... I know it's obviously are all of our fates at the end of the day, but um, I, I miss her every day. I can't believe it's been 16 years since she's been gone, but um, losing her is something that I'll never forget. So that, that was another traumatic experience. And then, obviously, the last one, shout out to my well love watching the video. I love you. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Um, the last traumatic experience for me, I, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, was, uh, the rejection I had in Oviedo, uh, last year. Um, I don't need to go further in explanation about that. I, I may I can talk about it on another show or something like that, but, um, it was traumatic because it was probably, like, the sharpest, like, pain I felt as, like, a personal, like, disvalidation, uh, in a way, but also for me, it was, like, I, for me, that rejection was a blessing because I avoided a trap. I I avoided the most biggest personal trap that ever came in my face. I thought I met my future wife. I thought I was going to go through the thing. And, you know, for me, I don't regret anything. Uh, in life, you can't regret things. You make decisions. You learn from them, good or bad. And... I don't regret that. I took a risk to go meet another girl's family. I met this girl about four years ago. We had a three-year bond. I uh, loved her. I uh, cared for her, helped her out the most part of her life. And even then, it still wasn't enough for her. <laughs> and that happens, you know. Uh, that's something that I'm, I'm not going to lose sleep over. Uh, that's her loss. And it, it, it felt traumatic at that point. But for me, it really... Um, really opens my eyes that I was like really making progress and I started to like trust myself and being confident and living my life on my own terms you know like that that's that's what I took away from that experience that rejection confirmed that I was on the right path that I was focused on my career I was focused on the right things and even for the fact that that still wasn't good enough for her that's her loss it's not a loss on my end I didn't lose anything out of it I took a risk. I would have done it a gazillion times over. And I'm grateful for that life lesson. You know, some of the times uh, I, I look at life and, uh, you know, sometimes we uh, deal with a lot of obstacles and some things that we don't want to deal with. But they're there for a reason and they're there for you to learn from them. And I learned a lot <laughs> from that rejection. I really did. Uh, did I get in the depression? Yeah, but I... I, I dealt with it, and I'm in a better place now. I'm happy, and I know what my focus are. I have my own place. I'm focused on my career. That's my primary focus, and just recording this show for you guys. So I have three different 
types of traumatic experiences. But in a lot of ways, those traumatic experiences really shaped me into the person I am right now. And that I, I don't give myself enough credit. And that's something that I realized over the years. That I don't give myself enough credit. I don't trust myself enough. And that I don't realize how internally strong I've been in my life, you know. Um, and I don't look for sympathy. I don't look for people to feel sorry for me. Uh, I believe in my faith. I believe in myself. And I look at life as an opportunity to grow because that's all you can do. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. And I want to make a lasting impact on people. So that's how it changed me. Honestly, they, all those experiences has made me a better person. I mentioned it last week, and I still stand by it. The day I got rejected by Lauren was the best day of my life. Because I, I found myself that day. I wasn't good enough for her, so that's what it was. You know, it is what it is. Um, next question, the last question for Nate. These, these have been some awesome questions, guys. <laughs> uh, do you believe in everything happens for a reason? I believe everything happens for a reason to a certain extent. Also, at the same time, when things don't come your way, and things don't happen like we're just talking about, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to take away from that experience? What are you going to take away when things don't go your way, or you do get rejected from a job, or you get rejected from a girl, or you get divorced, or you deal with a death? Like, everything does happen for a reason. I do believe in faith. I do believe in God. I do believe things happen for a reason. I trusted the bond that I had with Lauren, and that's what it was. <laughs> I do believe people come into your life for a reason. But also, I understand that things go to a certain extent, because things are not always guaranteed the next day. You're not guaranteed to live the next day. Uh, next day, You're not guaranteed to love somebody the next day. It's a constant uh, daily reminder that you have to really think about where you are in your life and how you go about things, how you view yourself, how you react to people, how you talk to people. And for me, it's I'm at the point of my life right now where I don't care whether people don't like me or if I'm not good enough for somebody, whatever. I really don't care. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> what, what I care about is being the best in my craft. And I care about being me and being myself. Like, I believe things happen for a reason. I think God brought me to this path of being a broadcaster. I think God brought me to loving professional wrestling. I do believe in that. I do believe in things. But I also know in the back of my head that I have to be cautious with people that are going to flake out on you. Because it's going to happen one way or another. It's, it's, it's bound to happen. We all deal with flaky people. We deal with flaky people in our families. We, feel, we deal with flaky people in relationships. We deal with flaky people as friends. <laughs> Hell, I haven't heard from my brother in about eight months. How about that? <laughs> uh, we're all busy. No beef or anything like that. But I haven't heard from him. You know, uh, life happens in weird ways sometimes. But um, for me, I... I think things happen for a reason, but also you have to really take a step back sometimes and think about why you're doing things. Why are you letting somebody bring you down over something you have no control over? Why would you want control over something outside of your career? That should, that should be the only thing that you should control. The only thing you can control is yourself. You can't control other people. You can't control the way life comes to you. You can't control that type of stuff. Don't put energy in it. Don't put energy on stuff you have no control over. Don't lose sleep over stuff you don't have control over. Well, I get it wrong. Even we have good days and bad days. We, have, we want days we want to lash out at people. We have days we want to blame people for our problems and stuff like that. But what are you getting out of that at the end of the day? What are you getting out of the day when you come home from work and you take your boo-boo energy towards your kids or your wife? What do you get out of that? You get some validation because you let some steam off your shoulders? The, do you feel more validated by that? By letting your anger out by other people and lashing out some people that you care about? What are you getting out of that? So, I think for me, 
Do I believe everything happens for a reason? Yes, I do. Even to the point that I knew Lord was the one for me, even though I got rejected. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> it's crazy. It happened for a reason. God brought her to my life for a reason at that certain time. And I'm grateful for that experience. I took a risk. I took the biggest risk of my life going down there. And it didn't end up the way I thought it was going to be. And it happened for a reason. I need to learn from that reason. That's the difference. That's the exception to the rule. These hap these happen to you, these come your way. What are you gonna do to adapt? What are you gonna do to address that issue head on? So um these are great questions. You guys really killed it today. I really do appreciate it. Um we've been going almost an hour with this already. This is crazy. <laughs> So, uh, thank you guys so much for checking out the Good Brothers Q&A session. All you have to do is send me a question at the Hoots Podcast or the Hoots Podcast at gmail.com. And um, I appreciate the support, everybody. And uh, when we come back, folks, right here on the Hoots Podcast, I'll get to this week in WWE. Paul, why the hell am I out here first? Where the hell is Edge at? So you make the mistake of disrespecting me all week long. And me being a nice guy, being a gentleman, I'm willing to let that slide, let that roll off the back of my shoulder, but you gonna make me wait? You gonna make the head, of the, read the shirt. You gonna make the head of the table wait? He's here? He's here. Edge is here. Then get his ass out here, Paul. Edge. Edge music and entrance, please. Pyro for Edge, please. Why would that man play games with me? Why would you play games with me? The last man that played games with me. His name was Kevin Owens. And he's no longer here anymore because I whooped his ass he's history he's gone you'll never see him again Edge I'm going to tell you this nicely You need to understand this because this is your only, this is your only chance. You're going to give me your decision by the end of the night. Edge. You are going to give me your decision by the end of the night. Dewey, congratulations on your victory tonight. You're now heading to TakeOver on Sunday where you compete in the finals of the Dusty Cup against MSK. But not only do you have an opportunity McKenzie, to win McKenzie, the whole up. thing. I've not got time for your nonsense today. Were you not watching what we've just been through out there? And no one is talking about 2020. 2020 was a write-off. All that matters now is one thing and one thing only. That is this Sunday, TakeOver Vengeance Day, Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic Finals. And we're up against MSK. A lovely bunch of lads with so much energy, full to the brim of pop culture references. And if this, if this were a contest of who could last the longest, 
in a game of Fortnite, maybe the lads would have a chance. And if this was who could produce the loveliest TikTok video, maybe those boys would be champions. But unfortunately for them, it is neither of those things. Unfortunately for them, it's a tag team wrestling contest. And we are every single bit of the very best tag team of this generation, bar none. The grizzled young veterans soon soon to be recognized as dusty classic winners we're back here in the who's podcast um sorry to talk about what happened this week in wwe i'm gonna give my thoughts really quick i'm on smackdown then quickly transition to uh predictions for uh takeover i don't want this to have to show over states welcome uh so just really quick i want to mention um when it comes to SmackDown, you guys heard the promo for Roman Reigns, which is top notch. The top, Tribal Chief is just the best thing in wrestling right now. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about the My Whole stuff with uh, Nia Jax, and it's been uh, some funny memes and stuff that came out of that for Raw uh, this past Monday night. And I, I stand by what I said on Twitter. Uh, she just absolutely sucks. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, if you guys are upset by that, but I have to call a spade a spade to be fair here. I'm not a fan of Nia Jax. Uh, uh, she does nothing for me as a performer, and her, like, passive-aggressive attitude is even more just... It's like, like I'm indifferent to Nia Jax. It's different from that, from me be like, oh, I don't like her because she's a mean person. It, then that would be me validating her job. I don't look at it as just storyline-based. It's just... I'm indifferent to her. She's not good at what she does. She's just not. She thinks she's better than what she is. And when you have a passive-aggressive person like that on television, it, it, it hits you. She's like slapping you in the face of that. Like, she's not good. <laughs> so, um, I want to mention that because, like, one thing I'm tired of with wrestling Twitter is lying one segment that they didn't think was the greatest thing to make that be the overall view of the entire show. Like, I heard a podcast that's still talking about Raw Legends Night, where the Legends weren't that much involved in the overall current stuff that was going on in that show, but this dude continues to talk about the Raw Legends Night. Like, it's the worst thing ever. And it's like, one segment, or one angle, or one decision does not cloud an entire view of the show. That's one of the things I hate about pay-per-view reaction shows. It's like, okay... I didn't get the winner. I won the main event, so that means the pay-per-view sucked. Or, oh, this person lost on Raw. She's buried. Oh, this person won on Raw. He's getting pushed, or he or she is getting pushed too much. It's like, y'all can't let the promotions win. <laughs> like, for me, like, when I when I view wrestling, I got a question about this earlier, about, like, how do I view wrestling? Do I think ratings matter? I critique wrestling based off the action in the ring. Like, you guys are so fixated on booking and storylines. I'm fixated on wrestling. I'm fixated at critiquing the wrestling. Like, <laughs> that's the difference. I'm bringing on these shows. You guys are going, you guys are going on soapboxes about things that you don't even fully believe in half the time. Like, <laughs> so... I'm not going to let one thing on the show cloud my view on the entire show. Her match with Lana with the tables match does not mean I think Raw sucked on Monday because I thought Raw was pretty good this week. I thought Raw was better than SmackDown this week. I'll give I'll give the Red Brand a notch this week. I've been all Team Blue over the last couple months, but I think Raw was a better show than SmackDown this week. Um... I'm very excited to see the Messiah come back and hopefully he gets into his feet with Dan Bryan, which I really want to see. And I'm a big fan of Seth Rollins, obviously, as you guys listen to the podcast. Um, big shout out to Bobby Lashley, man. This dude is just tearing up the place. And, uh, you know, Dave Priest picking up momentum. So you got two guys on the road to WrestleMania that are doing their good things. Um, I did not think we needed to have another Randy Orton Drew McIntyre match. I guess uh, the people behind the scenes think that we need to have like these blow off matches with Randy Orton and whoever he's been feuding with. But uh, I don't know why they needed to have that match. The match was fine. I just didn't think that match needed to be the main event. Um, we found out that 
at the Elimination Chamber. Drew McIntyre will be defending his uh, WWE title in the Elimination Chamber against five former WWE champions, which I think is a cool concept, actually. The playing field for the Chambers match for Raw is pretty good. I'm very excited to see what the second Elimination Chamber match will be. Will it be for the women? Will it be like a SmackDown Women's Chamber match? Will it be a Universal Title Chamber match? I'm very curious to see what they do with that tomorrow as I'm recording this on a Thursday. Um, I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, another thing, I was mentioning this already, like, oh, Shane McMahon comes out. Oh, why is Shane McMahon there? It's weird. It's odd. It's a fucking McMahon. <laughs> he could be on any show he wants. So, um, I'm, I'm watching uh, uh, NXT last night, and we're going to get some predictions. So, like, I going back to what I mentioned a couple minutes ago, I think Raw is a better show this week than SmackDown. And I'm excited to see what the Blue Brand does as a follow up uh, tomorrow night as we're on the road to the chamber. Um, so, going back to NXT, uh, we got TakeOver Vengeance Day coming up on Sunday. And we got five matches per ritual for TakeOver shows. Uh, we have Johnny Gargano take out Kushida for the North American Championship. I think Johnny Gargano will retain and beat Kushida some way or somehow. I think um, Johnny Wrestling will beat um, Kushida. I got... Um, we have the finals of the Dusty Cup for both the men and the women. I got Amber Moon and uh, Shotzi Blackheart to beat uh, Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai. Um, I think that's going to happen there. Uh, I think they win the Women's Dusty Cup. I have the Grizzled Young Veterans beating MSK, though. MSK versus the GYV is going to be a bar burner. I'm so excited for this match. I'm excited for the Grizzled Young Veterans if they're having their first domestic uh, NXT TakeOver opportunity. It just sucks that it's not in front of a crowd. I know we all have been saying that for every wrestling show these days, but it's the truth. I'm really bumped out for those guys. They're really good at what they do, and I'm a big fan of the Grizzled Young Veterans. So <laughs> uh, I got GRV winning the, uh, the Dusty Cup for the men. And then uh, the Triple Threat match for the NXT Women's title, I have Tony Storm beating Eel Shirai to become the new NXT Women's Champion. And then Finn Balor will retain over Pete Dunn in a fantastic bar burner of a match as well. So uh, I'm really excited for Bench State. It's a really good card from top to bottom, if you ask me. And um, I think it should be a fun show to uh, transcribe on Sunday. So be able to look out for that for the uh, WWE Network. I know that uh, Triple H had his uh, conference call with the media today. I'll make sure to go check that out later on tonight. So... Really good. That's my thoughts on this week in WWE. Some solid stuff from uh, Monday Night Raw. Really enjoyed the stuff with Roman Reigns and Edge on SmackDown. And go check out TakeOver. These TakeOver shows really disappoint. And I thought NXT's uh, episode last night was really, really good. So good stuff from NXT. All right. When we come back, uh, we'll get into some predictions for uh, Impact Wrestling's No Surrender event. And... I'll give you my thoughts on the new beginning uh, tour that I just finished covering for Nutrition Hair for us right here on the Hoots Podcast. All right, folks, one more last final break here in the Hoots Podcast, uh, ready to uh, talk about what's going on outside the WWE and AEW bubbles. We can talk about other stuff in the world of pro wrestling as uh, we got a period to make predictions for, yes, for the surrender of those. <laughs> uh, and some thoughts on uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling as well. I'm going to start off with the predictions as I got the card right here for No Surrender coming up on Saturday on Impact Plus. Impact Wrestling's, uh, maybe they do like a monthly special event uh, alongside the corresponding major event, which will be in April, I think, will be uh, Rebellion. It's their next big pay-per-view uh, for Impact. But uh, here we go. Uh, first match here, we got Tamil Dashwood in Triple uh, XL against... Decay with their new uh, stable mate, Black Taurus, as uh, he made his uh, return to Impact on uh, Tuesday. Uh, I have the Decay winning that match. Uh, we got Ace Austin from Blake Christian against Chris Bay, Davari, Josh Alexander, Suicide, Trey Miguel, 
and Willie Mack in a first ever triple threat revolver match. So the concept is you have three people in the match. Uh, whenever somebody gets pinned, another person enters the match. And then when it gets to the final three, the winner of that match, the, like, who gets the last fall, will be the winner of that match. So basically, we're having a revolver match. The winner of that match will become the number one contender to the Impact X Division Championship. I'm really intrigued by this concept. I never covered a revolver match, so this would be a first for me, and uh, it should be a fun one to jot down. All right. Deanna Perrazzo and Kimberly and Susan Young against Jordan Grace, Jazz, and ODB. I got the team of Jordan Grace winning that one. Uh, Kiara Hogan and Tasha Steeles against Havoc and Nevaeh in a no disqualification match for the Impact Knockouts Tag Team titles. Some way, somehow, I think Kiara Hogan and Tasha Steeles retains. Uh, by the way, I love their D song on Impact. Um, match number five here in the card here it says Cody Diener against Jake something. Uh, I think uh, Jake will defeat Cody Diener here. And uh, Violet by Design is an interesting group, by the way. Um, I know I really don't really hit on a lot of the storylines and stuff with Impact because I really, at the end of the day, you guys know me, I'm not really into like discussing booking on, oh, whether this is the right decision or wrong decision. I really like to keep my critiques specifically in the ring and just the overall show as a whole. Uh, but um, I've really been enjoying like the stuff with Violent by Design and Eric Gibbs doing some great, great stuff on Impact. So I just wanted to mention that really quick. Uh, I do have uh, Cody Dieter being Jake, though. Um, we got the Good Brothers against Private Party against James Storm and Chris Saban in a triple threat match for the Impact World Tag Team titles. I have the Good Brothers retaining here. That should be a good match. Um, I have Eddie Edwards and Matt Cardona defeating Brian Myers and Hernandez. I got TJP retaining over Rohit Raju for the Impact Exhibition title. And also the same thing as Rich Swan will defeat Tommy Dreamer in the main event on uh, Saturday. As uh, Tommy Dreamer will be celebrating his 50th birthday. So shout out to Tommy Dreamer. Um... I know this is a Impact Plus special, so this doesn't really bother me as much. And I think the storyline that they had going into this match with Rich Swan and Tommy Dreamer is good. If you guys haven't seen Tommy Dreamer's uh, promo from Impact this week, uh, I totally guys, I totally recommend it to you guys because it was really good. And uh, we always know Moose is lurking in the background as well. So um, some solid stuff going on with Impact. Um, I have no thoughts this week on AEW a- Dark because I'll save that for the segment. But... Um, Last thing I wanted to mention here for this outside of the AWW bubble segment here. Um, New Japan, I've just been <laughs> really busy after uh, Russell Kid working on this uh, New Japan in uh, New Japan New Beginning tour. Uh, we just finished two nights of New Beginning and Hiroshi- Hiroshima events. Uh, I saw uh, f- just some fantastic action. Uh, for the marquee matches over the last few days, where we had um, Hiromu Takahashi and show main event on the show from uh, yesterday on Wednesday uh, for the junior, junior heavyweight title, a 35 minute match, the longest junior heavyweight championship match in New Japan Pro Wrestling history. I thought that match was just absolutely phenomenal, and uh, I thought that was a lot of fun to jot down and transcribe. Um, uh, same thing with the Gorillas of Destiny. Uh, against Suzuki Gun for the heavyweight tag team titles. That match was really long as well. So that was a fun uh, match and event to cover on Wednesday. Um, and then this morning, uh, I woke up early to uh, get the second show out of the way for you guys so we can record this podcast. And um, get to see, I think my favorite match in the show today was the six man tag team. Uh, title match with uh, Chaos and Bullet Club because that match was absolutely insane. Yoshi Hashi pins Tama Tonga to retain the number one way tag team house with that victory. It looks like they'll get a shot at GOD sooner or later for the heavyweight tag team title. So I thought that was really cool. And then uh, the main event, Kota Bushi against Sonata, another fantastic match. Um, I felt the match was shorter than what it actually was. It was 27 minutes, but it felt like 15. Uh, maybe it was just how good the wrestling match was. And you, you guys notice that match started to slow down once you start making referees look bad and you're not following the rules and going 
gazillion miles an hour with in and out tags. It just delays the process of a match, in my opinion, just as an observation. But uh, Cody Bushi retained or not a fantastic match. And then uh, Nitzel came out. It looks like Nitzel will be getting his rematch uh, for the IWGP Double Championship. And also, I uh, wanted to mention, they announced that John Moxley will be taking on Kenta on February 26th on New Japan Straw for the IWGP United States Championship. So, what's next for me uh, is uh, getting ready for the Castle Attack Tour, which starts on Sunday. Um <laughs> It shit never stops, but uh, yeah, so I got Road to Castle uh, Attack events that I got to do this upcoming week, and then um, the, I think the Castle Attack shows will be at the end of the month, and then um, before you know we got the New Japan Cup coming around the corner as well, so lots, a lot of New Japan Pro Wrestling to cover, uh, uh, and um, you guys can check out all those articles at ProWrestlingTranscriptions.com. All right. We're about almost 90 minutes into this five broadcast. It's time to give the people what they want, pal. It's the marquee segment of all marquee segments in the world of professional wrestling. It's known as What the Hell is Wrong with AEW. We're going to start this bad boy off with Brother Carter in a 3, 2, 1. It's time for What the Hell is Wrong with A-E-W. What the hell is wrong with A-E-W? Okay, let's begin. And I talked about this last week, but how the hell does Joey Janela earn a TNT title shot? He's not good. His match was okay against Darby Allen, but it was really because of Darby Allen. Like, why does Janela get a TNT title shot? Well, further proof that the ranking system in AEW doesn't really matter. Well, you get a title shot. You get a title shot. You get a title shot. Everybody gets a title shot. The rankings mean nothing. Okay, I, if there's a great story behind this and there's something I'm missing, cool. But they made a real big deal of Lee Johnson getting his first win, and he's now 1-29 in as opposed to 0-30. So I, I don't know what the deal is, if that's part of the storyline. I don't know. I just thought that they put a little bit too much emphasis on him getting his first major win. Very, very, very strange to me. Then we get to the Young Bucks and Good Brothers promo. I have a question. How many old school wrestling references can be made in one promo? Further proof that AEW has no identity. They want to be everything except themselves in the worst possible way. Let's think about this. You have Bullet Club, Too Sweet, Red and Black, Wolfpack, Sting. Like, they basically tried to recreate WCW. This is what AEW wants to be. They want to be WCW of the 90s. And look what happened to that company. It's a freaking joke. It's just, it's, it's sad, really, is what it is. So Hangman Adam Page is being relegated to being torn between two groups instead of going out on his own. Why can't he just go out and be a kick-ass singles wrestler like he is? Now that being said, I did like what he did to Matt Hardy. That was pretty funny. I, I will give credit where that was due, where they, where they slipped a different contract. I'll be curious to see how that plays out because I said that. Uh, I, I actually did enjoy that. That was great. I say it every week and I'll say it again. Miro sucks. I don't care about him. Kip Sabian sucks. I don't care about him. I really liked Orange Cassidy, but I'm getting to the point where I don't care about Orange Cassidy anymore. He sucks. They suck. And they need to get off my television screen because they're horrible. Uh, I, I'm indifferent on the acclaimed. They try to be rappers, but they're not. Um, Chris Jericho is a complete shell of his former self. He needs to give it up. His promo work is decreasing. He can't go in the ring anymore. Chris Jericho needs to give it up. So let me understand this. The Team Taz Darby Allen Sting feud has basically become Taz interrupting Sting every single week in his promo because apparently he doesn't think that a legend can talk for himself. And then he goes out and tries to murder Darby Allen. Well, that's just great because again, committing murder, solid, solid stuff. And what's gonna and what's the result? Sting's gonna call out Team Taz next week. Ooh. I just hate to see what they've done with Team Taz because he 
Taz's promos when they when they let him to let him do what he actually could do was great. His stuff with Cody is, was awesome, but now he's been relegated to this crap, and it's just sad. Kenny Omega sucks. He gets worse every week. He is the biggest overseller and most overrated athlete in professional wrestling history. He gets worse and worse and worse. That golf court golf course skit with Adam Marvez was awful. I hated it. How has it taken AEW this long to get Lance Archer into a serious main event spot? He's great. Great in the ring. Great look. Good promo skills. How has it taken him this long? Oh, wait. He's not in the elite. He's not a part of the, the best friends club. Or not, I'm sorry, not best friends. All friends club. Best friends is an angle that's terrible. The all friends wrestling, as, as they're sometimes referred to. It's because he's not part of them. That's why it's taken them so long. They actually like, oh, wait, this guy's got talent. We should do something with him. What a surprise. And, of course, you couldn't have an issue or an episode of AEW Dynamite without barbed wire or some sort of stupid garbage match, death match, garbage wrestling, whatever, because that's all they can do. Like I said before, they want to be everything except themselves to ha and have their own identity in the worst possible way. Seriously, what the hell is wrong with AEW? This has been What the Hell is Wrong with A-E-W. Thank you very much, Brother Carter, for the submission this week. As always, it's my turn to talk about the wackiest world of professional wrestling, known as All Friends Wrestling. And... I sit back here and I ask myself, you know, last week I, I mentioned that I was just kind of interfering and I wasn't going to pop a blood vessel about AEW this week. And I'm not going to this week either. Um, I'm just going to tell you what I liked and didn't like and go from there. And, you know, if you guys get bothered by anything I say about AEW, I mean, that's that's not on me. It's on you. <laughs> that's why, because I'm so tired of, you know... Me speaking for myself, and that means, oh, I just hate AEW because I'm just a WWE guy. It's bullshit. I'm wearing a New Japan Pro Wrestling t-shirt right now. So, you know, you do you, I do me. I don't have an agenda. I call what I like, and I call what I don't like. And you guys are more fixated on booking and storylines. I'm fixated on the premise of what we watch this shit on, the wrestling. And that's what I'm going to be critiquing. So, I'll tell you what I did like on Dynamite this week before we get to the fun. Uh, I liked, like Brett Carr mentioned, I liked the stuff with Matt Hardy and Hangman Page. I thought that was pretty funny. I gotta say, man, Anna Jay is the hottest chick that's come out of wrestling in years. God, that woman's fucking beautiful. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, I wanted to mention this. Uh, big shout outs. To Thunder Rosa and Leia Hirsch, I really enjoyed your guys' match. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, Darby, uh, Al did what he could <laughs> to save time with Jelly Nutella in the ring. I still don't know why, why that dweeb got a title match based off of what. I'll uh, get to that in just a couple minutes. But Darby Allen looked good in the ring. Um, what else? Happy for Lee Johnson that he got his first victory in AEW, even though I did not like the match and I thought it was way too long. Um, I, I thought I was really happy for Lee Johnson because I cover all his matches on AEW Dark, aka the Marathon, and he has a, like an 0 30 record. So I'm glad he finally got off the losing snot and uh, he got his victory. But it also bleeds into. As always, what's wrong with AEW is the fact that we always got to put the EVPs on the pedestal. And, you know, instead of getting yourself over, you have to talk about how much Cody had played an influence on him getting to where he's at right now. I get it. You're part of the Nightmare family and all that stuff. But even then, get yourself over. You got to maximize your TV time, not put other people over. Um, let's start off with this commentary. When Excalibur says, you know, if anything happens, uh, a, a match could possibly uh, conclude before Pitcher Pitcher Break will let you guys know. Does any match in AEW ever end before a commercial break or a Pitcher Pitcher Break on AEW? No, it doesn't. Every match 
literally almost has two segments or sometimes three segments to it. I remember one match where they mentioned that, oh, and this actually were to continue, we go to uh, picture and picture. They always go through picture and picture. Just say you're going to picture and picture. We know the drill here. You guys haven't established enough starts to the point where you think of, okay, we have so-so versus so-so in this match could end at any moment. The only people you can say that is possibly like Lance Archer against somebody from the dark roster. But you guys don't do squash matches. Every match on Dynamite is freaking competitive, and sometimes it's a good thing, and a lot more times it's a bad thing. Speaking of bad things, uh, Chris Jericho and MGF against uh, The Acclaimed. Uh, I thought that match sucked. I, I thought the match layout sucked. Uh, Aubrey Edwards sucks. Uh, let's just throw that out there really quick. Like It makes no sense to me. You guys decide that you want to extend the the time it takes to get out of the ring after a tag to make it look cooler and not be old school, right? So that's why we have the 10 second rule. But now it gets to the point where you can't even get a guy out of the ring for 15 or 45 seconds. It's nonsense. I, I understand the concepts of heel taking advantage of the referee rules and taking advantage of counts and stuff like that. I understand that. But when it comes to the point where you're making the referee look stupid, okay, you have 10 seconds to get out of the ring. Why are you doing double team spots for three minutes until the guy gets out of the ring? There was no tag outs. It's just... And, it's, it, and I, I hate picking on the girl, but it, it happens all the time in her matches. Like, if you're not going to have rules, if you're going to be portrayed as the sports-based wrestling promotion, act like it. Enforce some damn rules for once. Oh, her kicking MJ's hand off the rope does not impress me. Because you're still allowing shit to happen behind her back where she's literally looking as it happens. She's a terrible ref. And I can pinpoint this stuff out because I know every little move that happens in the match. That's the job of a transcript. You're supposed to jot everything down. And I really don't want to harp on referees because I love referees. And I think referees don't get enough respect and attention that they deserve to the overall presentation of a wrestling show. You guys are so fixated on these podcasts talking about booking, about why this is a bad decision or that's a bad decision. You know, all three things need to be core in line for a match to be good in the first place. Think about that. Without a referee, the match is just a match. It's just there. You have the narrators call the match in the background, but the guy literally steering the ship is either the guy calling the match in the ring or the referee that was assigned to the match. And, you know, maybe I'm one of the few wrestling media members that cares about referee integrity and, you know, making your wrestling matches look credible. Uh, but that's the thing. I want to mix something here so we don't, we're not fully negative here. I really enjoyed. Uh, Jungle Boy's uh, pro- promo. I really did. I really enjoyed Jungle Boy's promo. I thought that was really good. Uh, so shout out to Jungle Boy. Give a quick shout out for there. Uh, the main event. Moxley and Kenta. Uh, no, my bad. Moxley and Archer against... Um, Moxley and Archer against Kenta and Olivier. <sighs> Look, there's a lot of crazy stuff, and I thought the, you know, the Kenta DDT on the, um, what was it called, the the buffet table, I thought that was really cool. Uh, there was some, a lot of wild action, but for me personally, I'm not a fan of Crash TV. I'm just not. I'm not a fan of it. I've never been a fan of it. It, it, it takes away from the purpose of a match and a show. Uh, I get it. Crash TV works for what that era was in the Attitude Era, but this is not the same thing. NXT and AW are not on the same level of what Raw and Nitro were back in the day. And I know that AW tries so hard to recapture those WCW fans by doing WCW concepts, but it's not a good look. It's just not. Okay, you have two guys with beasts with each other, so we just need a fall call, falls count anywhere matches to just have wild chaos, okay? But you guys are fighting after titles. Why do we need a hardcore match? 
just to do a hardcore match. We just need a barbed wire baseball bat to be brought in the ring because that's the only way Moxley gets his heat and energy from his feuds from. I just think it's fucking stupid, to be honest with you. Okay, uh, Olivier and Kenta won the match. Awesome. Still don't care about the Good Brothers stuff. Don't even get me started on that freaking Olivier golf course segment. Because you want to tell me, Dave Meltzer, that that's the best wrestler in the world? You are full of shit. I don't care how many moves he does in the ring. He fucking sucks on the bike. He's not believable. He's the least intimidating top guy I've ever seen in my entire life. Again, <laughs> keep making the same mistakes and expecting different outcomes. Uh, it's going to turn the bite to your ass sooner or later. And, you know, a lot of people like to think that AEW is an alternative, but more times than not, you realize they're more WWE than you want to admit. They're more sports entertainment than pro wrestling. And that is what the hell is wrong with AEW this week. All right, folks. I want to thank you guys so much for checking out the podcast this week. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at the Hoots Podcast. Make sure to hit me up on Instagram, Instagram at Joshie Lopez94. That's J O S H I E Lopez94 on Instagram at Josh Lopez Music as well. If you want to see me do some guitar covers, um, be on the lookout on the YouTube channel uh, this week. I may have a couple of bonus episodes for you guys this week. Uh, I can't give too much information just yet. You just guys have to be on the lookout for it. So just. I got some good stuff for you guys uh, around the corner. And uh, don't forget, make sure to book our pro wrestling transcriptions.com if you could. If you could as well, please leave us a four or five star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps expand the reach of the podcast. And I really want to get engaged with what you guys think about the podcast. And um, that's pretty much it. I just want you guys to remember, as always, to be the authentic product that is yourself. Uh, remember, you are dictating the pace of your life. Nobody else. And also, don't forget... Um, to enjoy Vengeance Day and No Surrender coming up this weekend. I'll have those articles for you on ProWrestlingTransfusion.com. I'm the Nefarious Brother Adam. Thank you guys so much for checking out episode 230, uh, 244 of the Hoots Podcast. And right now, we're going to send off to the one and only Brother Carter with this week's edition of the Thoughts of Derrico. I love you guys. We'll talk to you next week. Like, yes, sir. And now, the Thoughts of Derrico. Listen well, man. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the hopefully one day goat of podcast segments. It is the thoughts of Derrico featuring the one, the only, Brother Carter. Lots to talk about this week. Got some good stuff for Raw, SmackDown, and even some stuff I enjoyed about AEW this week. So let's get into it, and then I'll give my predictions for the NXT TakeOver Vengeance Day event coming up this weekend. Well, just a couple of them anyway, and we'll get into that in a moment. So starting with SmackDown this week, is this feud with King Corbin and the Mysterios ever going to end? I feel like it's been going on for a really long time and just hasn't really gone anywhere. And Maybe it's just me, and I'm just... For, for whatever reason, something's not clicking with me. But for some reason, I just feel like this feud has gone on longer than it should. Uh, Baron Corbin needs to do something else. So does the Mysterios. Now, that being said, I liked Ray cheating and embracing the uh, the Eddie Guerrero, uh, you know, lie, cheat, and steal thing for his son. I thought that was cool, and I like where this is going. So can Daniel and Cesaro just, Daniel Bryan and Cesaro just face each other and wrestle every week? Because that would be fine. I would enjoy that very much. And apparently Cesaro is turning face randomly for some reason, so... Okay, great. But another great match between the two of them if they want to wrestle every week. I think that'd be great. Okay, that video of Bianca Belair's parents uh, on Instagram when she won the Royal Rumble, that was so damn cool. Like, to see how excited your parents are for you winning and then, like, the dad falling off the couch, like, that was awesome. And I can tell that that was unscripted, and that was great. It's always a really cool moment. Uh, to see parents be that excited for their kids. I, I think that that's just, that was really, really, really cool. So I like that. Not sure who I wanted to choose uh, at WrestleMania. I'm, I'm hoping she'll choose Sasha Banks because I would like to see that match because I think Asuka is going to be doing something with Alexa Bliss. But I, I would like to see Bianca Belair take on Sasha Banks. I think that could be a really great match and I would like that very much. 
Uh, the Street Profits are so entertaining. When they were on the color commentary for the tag match with, with Rude and Ziggler and, and, the, and the Lucha Underground, that was hilarious. So that was great. I really enjoyed that. The Street Profits are very entertaining. Uh, really good Intercontinental Triple Threat match. Big E, Sami Zayn, Paulo Cruz, fantastic stuff, uh, but no surprises there. And then a great way to end SmackDown. Love seeing KO back, and I'm glad that Edge and Bianca aren't going to choose for a while. Build the suspense. I like it. Switching gears to Raw, uh, they're doing a six-way dance for the WWE title inside the Elimination Chamber. I like it. I see no reason for Drew McIntyre to not get the win there, but uh, I could set up some feuds, set up some stuff down the road. So I think that could be entertaining and a lot of fun. Matt Riddle is a master motivator and an orator. The Air Bud analogy was hilarious. I mean, that was just great when he was talking about, he's like, I got a little bit baked and then I went and watched Air Bud and all the movies. I thought that was hilarious. Um, I also love how he casually reminds people of his first name because of the M Riddle on his jacket. I mean, even he realizes that he should be Matt Riddle and not just Riddle because Riddle by itself is stupid. Um, I, I just don't see where retribution goes from here. Um, uh, you know, what have they done as of late? They started out hot in, su- in last May, June of 2020 and their storyline that w- I was loving it. But now Mustafa Ali has just continued to lose and lose and lose. And all the guys still have their, and, and girls have their face masks on still like get rid of the face masks, call them by the real names and let them be a kick-ass stable. However, I do like Xavier Woods challenging reckoning. I think that's hilarious, and I would love to see that. That would be really, really funny. Ric Flair said he's having a casual relationship with Lacey Evans, and I love it. Slick Rick continues to oppress me every single week, and man, does he still got it. The chemistry with him and Charlotte is incredible. Uh, obviously, I mean, no surprises there, but their chemistry is unbelievable. I also forgot... How good Lacey Evans is. She was great in her match with Charlotte. Really good stuff. But Charlotte proves once again why is she, how good she is both inside and outside of the ring and why she is the goat of women's wrestling. Woo! Great in ring stuff. Great out of ring stuff. Edge and Miz both still got it. That was a great promo from the two of them. I loved every single, every single bit of that. That was awesome. Um, so it looks like Bad Bunny has his own entrance music, video, and pyro. So he gonna be around for a while. And you know, listen, I'm fine. If he's an entertainer that really understands and wants to do well in the business, I have no problems with that. I mean, it's fine. Um, like if he, if he genuinely cares about the product and wants to get better, that's fine. And and I have I have no problems with that doing the crossover stuff. It's it's WWE is an entertainment company. They're not a sports company. I get it. So you got to do those crossover things. I have no problems with that at all. Uh, Damian Priest looks fantastic. He's going to be world champion soon. He looks amazing. When he did the, when he made his name appear from the bottom of the big, uh, not Titan Tron, but whatever that big Jumbotron is in the, above the Thunderdome, that was really cool. I like that. Keith Lee and Matt Riddle are freaking awesome. That was a very nice match between the two of them, but holy crap, Bobby Lashley is looking incredible and strong as well. Why is he not in the chamber match? God, he looks good. He could just rip down those doors. I wish Bobby Lashley would have been in the title match, uh, in the chamber match, but he's defending his U.S. title, and I get it. Uh, so Lana somehow puts Nia Jax through a table. Boy, her hole hurts. And uh, we're going to get a U.S. triple threat match at the elimination chamber. Hell yes. The whole, the my hole joke was, I, I made that just because of the, the my hole thing with Nia Jax, which is hilarious, so... Anyways, really enjoyed Raw uh, this week. Just a couple things I enjoyed about AEW this week. Uh, Darby Allen is fantastic. He is somebody you can absolutely build the company around. Love me some Darby Allen. Um, he definitely held Joey Janela up in his match, for sure. Uh, MJF is finally, finally doing his old tricks and trying to be sneaky and record himself to get what he wants with Sammy Guevara. Thank you. Where has that MJF been for a while? Like, that's the MJF we want to see. That's the MJF that you can build a company around. That stuff was great. Let's see more of that from MJF, please. Um, Pac is awesome. He needs to be in a world title match soon. I know that'll never happen because he's not one of the elite and he's not a part of the Friends Club. And Tony, you know, he's not part of the Tony Khan Club. But um, Pac is unbelievable in the ring. Like, God, he moves so well. He's a tremendous athlete, and he does it in a very believable way. So Pac 
is great. Sammy Guevara has done the smartest thing he's ever done in his career by quitting the inner circle. Get him away from that group. They need to get rid of the inner circle. Abandon the inner circle. It doesn't work. So props to Sammy Guevara for finally getting smart and getting away. Maybe he'll reboot and come back, uh, cost Jericho and MJF the tag titles at Revolution. Uh, I think that'd be great. And hopefully we get to see new things from Sammy Guevara because I do believe that he has potential. And then a very nice match with Thunder Rosa and Layla Hirsch. I will say it's it's actually surprising to see that we've gotten positive and good women's matches from AEW for multiple weeks in a row. That's actually kind of shocking, you know, considering I think that AEW stands for anyone except women. But props to AEW. They've had multiple uh, weeks in a row of good women's matches. I like it. And now I want to quickly give my thoughts for uh, the TakeOver uh, Vengeance Day coming up this Sunday. Uh, should be a good match. Obviously, there's going to be more matches to come. Uh, I'm recording this after not having seen NXT this week. So the only two matches I know about are the two title matches. We've got the NXT Women's Championship match, Io Shirai, Tony Storm, and Mercedes Martinez. I'm going to take Io Shirai to retain. Um, I think that she is just absolutely incredible, and I want to see her. Uh, I actually wouldn't mind seeing her against Bianca Belair at WrestleMania. But I hope that she'll get to defend her title at WrestleMania. I don't know who her opponent would be. Maybe Tony Storm one-on-one, but uh, I think Io Shirai is going to retain, and I think that that's going to be a terrific match. And then we have Pete uh, Pete Dunne and Finn Balor for the NXT Championship. This uh, this is going to be a war. I love Finn Balor. I love Pete Dunne. I say Finn Balor retains here, and he's going to eventually go on and defend his, his NXT Championship at WrestleMania. I don't know who his opponent will be, but it'll be great to see Finn Balor at WrestleMania where he so rightly deserves. And those are the thoughts of Derrico this week. Uh, enjoy Vengeance Day this weekend, everybody. And my f- final thought is there is no debate about it now. Tom Brady is the greatest athlete in the history of team sports, period, the end. He got the job done, year one, new team. He has more Super Bowl championships than all current NFL, a single current NFL franchise. Like, think about that. He himself has more Super Bowl titles than any NFL franchise. Tom Brady, GOAT status achieved. Well done, sir. My hat is off to you. This has been The Thoughts of Derrico. You're smarter now, man.